All the cool jobs you want to apply for are asking for it, and all your developer friends are talking about it. But what is Kubernetes, and how do you get started with it? Well, here's a high-level roadmap for getting started with Kubernetes. First, let's learn what containers and Kubernetes are. Then, let's learn the fundamental infrastructure of Kubernetes, and then finally, we'll start using it by setting up a local Kubernetes environment. Let's hop to it. What's up, everybody? I'm Caleb from Semitext, and at Semitext, we build a full-stack monitoring system that is capable of monitoring multiple instances of Kubernetes. It does a whole lot more, like centralizing your logs, monitoring infrastructure, and aggregates pretty much all the metrics that you ever need into one place with great alerting. All this to say that our team is pretty intimately familiar with the ins and outs of Kubernetes. So let's get you up to speed. First, let's get a working definition. Kubernetes is an open-source container orchestration platform. That's a mouthful, so let's break it down. What is a container? A container is a lightweight, standalone, and executable software package that includes everything needed to run a piece of software, including the code, runtime, system libraries, and its dependencies. It's essentially a packed up piece of software with all of its codes and dependencies inside. A major selling point for containers is that the container is essentially isolated and utilizes the resources of the host machine very, very well. So it doesn't slow down like a normal virtual machine, and because it isn't dependent on anything external, it can run almost on any machine, which is very helpful in testing and in production. If the container works on your machine at home, it should work pretty much anywhere else. And these awesome little containers are built out of what's called images. A container image is a template, sort of like a blueprint, used to create a container. An image is a static file made of system libraries, system tools, and other platform settings a software program needs to effectively run. It essentially is the software just super compressed down in size, and it can't run on its own. It needs a runtime environment. So the container image is built, or run, on a containerization tool, such as Docker or Podbin, and consists of multiple layers that represent the various components of the application stack. When a container is created from an image, it inherits all the properties and configurations defined in the image. So that's a lot to understand, and there's actually even more that's going on behind the scenes. But to simplify it down, think of a standing mixer. And think of images as the bowl. You can put a little bit of Ubuntu in there, you can put Nginx, some custom code, or whatever you want. And the container is like the mixer, where it all comes to life. You can tell the mixer, or the container, to start and stop. And as I mentioned earlier, the best part about this whole process is that your little container, or mixer, has everything that it needs. It's not really dependent on the type of host OS. It's all contained inside of the container. This means that you can run your containerized application pretty much anywhere, and the apps inside of the container have no idea where it is, and it doesn't really care either. Mac, Linux, servers, Windows, it doesn't matter. It's very useful and very helpful. That's a super high level overview of containers, but if you want to learn more, check out some of the other materials that we have on Docker. And by the way, I highly recommend that you get intimately familiar with Docker or any other containerization platform before you jump into Kubernetes, because when we understand containerization, a lot of those concepts about runtime environments will cross over into Kubernetes. The next part of our definition for Kubernetes is that it is a container orchestrator, and this has to do with the container management and lifecycle. Kubernetes is a tool that you can configure to automatically manage and oversee the lifecycle of your containers. Just like how a music conductor directs and guides an orchestra, so does Kubernetes direct and orchestrate your containers. In many cases, Kubernetes is quite frankly a little overpowered. Kubernetes is built to work with lots and lots of nodes and even more containers. So think big, like really big, because it's important to understand that Kubernetes works in a distributed manner. Your containers are spread across multiple nodes and the workload is distributed. This enables high availability and is basically a fancy way of saying it has redundancy and failover. The second step to getting started with Kubernetes is knowing what Kubernetes is made of. So let's talk about architecture, starting small and then working our way out. Kubernetes smallest unit is called a pod, and it's essentially a container, but we can't call it that because Kubernetes is sailing themed and it involves whales, and a pod is a group of whales, so it's a very cool name. A pod can represent one or more containers that are always scheduled together. They can be on the same node and even share the same network namespace. Containers within a pod can communicate via localhost, making it easy to design co-located, tightly coupled components. Anyways, just like how you would start up an image inside of a Docker container for it to run, the same thing happens here in Kubernetes. However, in Kubernetes, you can determine what type of container runtime environment you want your image to be in, so you are not just limited to using Docker. Like containers, pods are ephemeral and can be rescheduled to different nodes during their lifecycle. Pods can be managed by higher level abstractions like deployments or replica sets to ensure the desired number of replicas and rolling updates. 
So that's a pod, pretty cool. Zooming out even more, pods are deployed on nodes. In Kubernetes, a node is a physical or virtual machine that forms the underlying infrastructure of the cluster. Kubernetes uses the leader follower model. However, it's named a little bit differently. Leaders are called the control plane and the follower nodes are just called nodes. Nodes are the environment where the pods are hosted. Nodes can be added or removed dynamically to scale the cluster horizontally. For this task, each node has its own little brain called the kubelet. The kubelet manages the pods and the resources of that nodes. So kubelets are an essential Kubernetes component and they run on each node in the cluster. Kubelets manage and maintain the state of the node, ensuring that the containers specified in the pods manifest are running and healthy. It monitors the health of the container and restarts them if they fail. The kubelet also reports the status of the node and its containers back to the control plane, providing vital information about the node's health. Speaking of which, let's talk about the leader of this whole operation, the control plane. The control plane is the leader node and has a set of Kubernetes components that collectively manage the entire cluster and its state. The primary components of this control plane include the Kubernetes API server, which exposes the Kubernetes API and allows users and components to interact with the cluster. Think of it like the front end for the control plane. There's also ETCD, a distributed key value store that stores the entire state of the cluster, serving as the back end of the Kubernetes API server. There is also the Kubernetes controller manager, which manages various controllers responsible for maintaining the desired state of the resources by reconciling the current state with the desired state. Then there is the Kubernetes scheduler. It assigns pods on nodes based on resource requirements, policies, and constraints. And optionally, there is the Cloud Controller Manager. This interacts with the cloud provider's API and manages and integrates with cloud-specific resources. There are actually a lot more pieces to the control plane, but I think that's enough to get us started. All of the controller plane components work together to ensure that the entire cluster operates as per the user's desired state and takes action to maintain that desired state. It monitors the state of resources, enforces desired configuration, and handles events like scaling, deployments, and pod scheduling. The control plane is pretty much the whole brains of this operation and is the UI that we will be using to interact with our cluster. It provides the intelligence and decision-making capabilities needed to orchestrate and manage the distributed containerized applications running in the Kubernetes cluster. And there is one last bit, kubectl, or kubectl for those who can read. There's actually a very hot debate about how to pronounce this, but I'm a huge fan of cuddling. So kubectl is a command line tool used to interact with and control your cluster. Now putting all this knowledge together, let's see what Kubernetes looks like in action. We interact with the API of the control plane. The control plane will send the instructions to the kubelets, and the kubelets will manage the pods on their nodes, and the pods build up your image or application. Sounds a little complex, but it's actually not that bad. So that's a big overview of the architecture of Kubernetes. Let's set it up locally and start playing with it. Besides, your future employer will probably expect you to have at least 15 years of experience with Kubernetes anyway, so you might as well start now. There are many ways to start messing around with Kubernetes. The first way would be to use the real deployment platforms. The big players are GKE, EKS, and AKS. Sometimes these companies will give you a few hours for a free trial. You can test out their systems and see what it's like using these tools because eventually you will have to use them as a developer. But who wants to be rushed like that? The best and easiest way to do this is with Minikube. Minikube is a test environment that creates a little virtualized control plane and nodes on one machine. It's worth mentioning that Minikube doesn't implement the full Kubernetes API, so it's not very useful for actual testing. It's just for practicing. A very good but a bit more complicated option is to use K3S. It's a bit more completed, but it's also a way more complicated option for local environments. So I'd recommend starting out with Minikube and then moving up to K3S, so let's do that. If you are on Windows, the easiest way to go about doing this is to install Chocolaty. It's a software management tool and makes installing software much easier. With Chocolaty installed, it's an easy Choco install Minikube. Similar story on Mac, but you use Homebrew. Brew, Homebrew, same thing. Regardless of what system you want, you will probably use software management tools a ton as a developer, so go ahead and install the appropriate one on your system. Now it's a simple brew install minikube. And for the million various Linux distributions, I refer you to the docs. Now that we have minikube installed, the next thing you are going to want to do is consider subscribing. And once you have thought about it, let's start up minikube. To start up minikube, we go into the terminal and type minikube start. 
Now you might have gotten an error, something to the effect of VM drivers not found. This means you have no virtualization software. If you don't know what this is, I recommend you just download Docker Desktop and use Docker as your VM. So try again with the Docker engine running and Minikube should start up and install with no problems. Next, we're going to want to create a directory for our app and CD into that directory. Make directory Kubernetes demo CD Kubernetes demo. Next, let's make a file called app.yaml and define the Kubernetes deployments for the application. This may look different depending on your use case, but in this example, I'm making a simple Kubernetes deployment with two replicas of an Nginx web server. Within this file, we need to define a few things. First, the API version for the deployment resource, and the kind of file that this is, which in this case should be deployment. We have the option to add metadata for this deployment, which I'll just give the name Nginx deployment. And then the specs. The specs section of a Kubernetes deployment YAML file specifies the desired state of a deployment, including the number of replicas, pod templates, and other configuration details. Replicas specify the desired number of replica pods you want to maintain. Here I have it set to two, which means the deployment should ensure that there will always be two replica pods of the specified template, which we will define our template in a little bit. But before the template, we will make a selector. The selector field is used to determine which pods are affected and controlled by this deployment. It defines a set of labels that the deployment uses to identify its pods, and under the selector, we will use match labels. Match labels is a map of label key value pairs. There's a lot of metadata that you can use within match labels, but in this example, the deployment selects pods with the label app engine X. This selector is used to determine which existing pods should be part of this deployment and which should not. Now, templates. As you might expect, the template is the pod template for creating new replica pods. We add metadata to give more information about this template. So under metadata, we add the labels field and we add the label app engine X to each pod. We do this so that in later deployments, we can select and or change all the pods by app name if we so choose. Now, specs again to define the parameters for containers that will actually run in the pods. And within this, we specify our containers, which is just a list of containers to run within the pod. And from here, it's just like Docker. You want to give your container a name like Nginx or web app or whatever, and then define your image and image version. I'll break my own rule here and use the latest tag. And then we also want to make sure that we open up those ports and then hit save. And now we can deploy this application using kube cuddle. So kube cuddle apply and an F tag. The F lets Kubernetes know that you are giving it a file and then you want to list the file's name. In this case, app.yaml. And then we can verify that the pods are running by doing kube cuddle get pods. Or we can use the dashboard that comes with minikube with minikube dashboard. And you should see two pods in the running state. Now we can access the application. Since it's locally hosted, accessing it won't be a challenge. Just know that in production with a full-fledged version of Kubernetes, accessing your application may look a little bit different. Congratulations, you just created your first app using Kubernetes. Now let's look at some scaling. Let's scale the deployment to have four replicas. It's actually really easy. Cube cuddle scale deployment, the name of your application, replica equals four. And bam, easy. Let's verify that the scaling actually worked. Cube cuddle get pods. And you now have multiple instances of your app running. If one of them fails for some reason, Kubernetes will try its darnest to keep it at four. And if you want to quickly stop the pods, you can simply scale down to zero with kubectl scale zero, which will remove all the containers across the selected objects. So to recap, you've successfully set up Minikube, deployed a simple web application, and performed some basic scaling. These very simple hands-on tasks should give you a practical understanding of the basics of Kubernetes and provide a strong foundation for further exploration of more advanced topics. Subscribe!